Hello everyone. In the previous video lecture, we saw the theory of guna conceptualized by Dandin and Utphada. In Dandin's Kavya Darsha, we saw a resurrection of the idea of guna which was neglected previously by Bhamaha. We saw that Dandin mentions 10 gunas in his Kavya Darsha. All these 10 gunas are the same as the ones mentioned by Bharata in his Nati Shastra, although Dandin's definition of these gunas differs a little. Dandin's discussion of guna is closely associated with his discussion of marga or style. After Dandin, we saw Patta Utpada's approach to the question of guna. The most important aspect that we need to note in Utpada's theory is that Utpada does not make a distinction between gunas and alankaras. He is of the view that both are elements that add charm to poetic beauty and there is no need to make a distinction between these two. According to him, it is people who follow the old tradition blindly who come up with this distinction. This view of Utpada was later criticized by Vamana. Not only did Vamana criticize the views of Utpada, he also made some original contributions to the theory of Guna. In this class, we are going to see the view of Vamana who made revolutionary contributions to literary theory through his novel conception of the notion of poetic merits or Guna. Like Bharata, Vamana also considers Guna as the absence of doshas. He says qualities or gunas principally consist in the absence of defects or doshas. Vamana in Kavyalankara Sutravarti talked about ten gunas, namely Ojas, Prasada, Shlesha, Samada, Samadhi, Mathurya, Sugumarata, Udaratva, Arthavyakti, and Kandi. These are the same gunas listed by Dandin and Bhamaha earlier. But Vamana applied it to Shabda or the word and Artha or meaning. So each guna had an application to sound as well as sense. Before we get into a very serious discussion about the other aspects related to guna, let's take a look at the definition of Shabda gunas and Artha gunas furnished by Vamana in his Kavya Alankara Sutravarti. First, we will see the Shabda Gunas. The primary Shabda Guna that Vamana mentions is Ojas. Ojas is the compactness of word structure and it results from the maturity of conception. The next Guna that he refers to is Prasada. What is Prasada? Prasada is the flexibility of structure. It is possible for an opponent to argue that prasada, which is the flexibility of structure, cannot become a guna, since it is the opposite of the guna called ojas, which is the combatness of word structure. Vamana says that there is no problem in this conception at all, and he has an answer to this problem as well. He says, Prasada in its pure form is definitely a dosha, there is no doubt about it. But when it is mixed with the quality called ojas, it turns out to be a guna. Vamana says that just as the mixture of pain and pleasure in dramatic performances of tragic events gives the readers happiness, so also the mixture of prasada and ojas gives us pleasure. Sometimes, the degree of ojas will be higher than that of prasada. At some other times, prasada will be higher in intensity than ojas. Sometimes, the degree of both these qualities will be the same. In all these forms, the mixture of compactness of structure we find in ojas and the flexibility of structure we find in prasada enlivens the heart of the readers. The next guna that Vamana describes is Shlesha. Shlesha is the smooth combination of words. Vamana says, 
by shlesha is meant that quality whereby a number of words conjoin together and appear to be a single word as an example for this vamana cites the words astyustarasyam dishi devadatma from kumara sambhava of kalidasa samata is the next quality that vamana is explaining he says that it is a quality that results from the similarity of words con word construction it is the homogeneity of diction in other words when the style of diction employed in the beginning of a verse or of a complete poetical work is continued to the end we have what is called samata samadhi is the symmetry of words it consists in the orderly sequence of ascent and descent vamana further explains this quality in the following words a line or words is said to have the quality of symmetry or samata when it is found to be so wedded that the heightening effect of the forcible style is toned down by a judicious sprinkling of words of the softer kind or when the softening effect of the less vigorous style is heightened by the introduction of words of the forcible kind at this juncture vamana also presents a purva paksha criticism against the quality called samadhi the opponent will now argue that samadhi is not a guna per se since it is already found in ojas and prasada vamana says some critics are of the view that samadhi is not a separate quality by itself as the ascent and descent are the same as ojas and prasada respectively but vamana does not agree with this observation he says it is not right to assert that ascent consists in ojas and descent in prasada because it is possible to find ojas without ascent and prasada without descent the next quality that vamana mentions is mathurya what is mathurya mathurya is the combination of words without long compounds in other words when in a piece of composition the words are quite distinct from one another it is said to have the quality of sweetness that is to say sweetness consists in the absence of long compounds next is saukumarya saukumarya is the lack of harsh sounds the next guna called utarada is the liveliness of words vamana further exemplifies his position he says it is that quality by virtue of which people feel that the words are dancing it is called the vikadatva of words in other words the arrangement of words in such a manner that the number of letters in them gradually increases the penultimate guna that vamana mentions is artha vyakti it is the explicitness of words finally the last guna is kanti kanti is the richness of words for example if we use the word welkin instead of sky or evins instead of to show we are trying to attain attain the richness of words or kanti finally in a series of sutras vamana succinctly summarizes all these 10 shabda gunas <clears throat> i will reproduce vamana summary for your reference vamana says the poets give the name ojas to the ornate style words abounding in the quality are very pleasant to the ear when ojas which is characterized by the presence of compounds is accompanied by plainness it is called prasada without this quality there is no happiness in a poetical work shlesha is that excellent quality by by, by which words seamlessly merge with each other in such a manner that they appear as one word here conjunctions of letter are not noticed and the conjunction of words looks smooth and natural samata is the quality consisting in the using of the same style of diction in each food or words 
Samadhi is the symmetry of words. It consists in the orderly sequence of ascent and descent. Mathurya is the combination of words without long compounds. Saukumarya is the lack of harsh sounds. Udharata is the liveliness of words. Arthavyakti is the explicitness of words. And finally, Kanti is the richness of words. Pramana observes that the existence of these qualities cannot be denied since they actually exist. He also says that these qualities are not naturally present in them. If they were naturally present in writing, then uh, it would have been present in all kinds of writings. But that's not the case in reality. So, it can be found only in those writings which are known for their special composition or Vishishtapada Rajana Riti. After explaining the Shabda Gunas, Vamana goes on to explain the Artha Gunas or the poetic merits of sense. The names that Vamana gives to the Artha Gunas are the same as the names of Shabda Gunas. The Artha Guna called Ojas is the maturity of conception. According to Vamana, it is of five kinds. The kind of Ojas where a whole sentence is used to express what is expressible by a single word. The variety where a single word is used to express what is expressible by a sentence. The variety where there is brevity, that is one sentence serving the function of many sentences. The variety of ojas where many sentences are used to express what can be stated by a single sentence. And finally, the type where qualifications are added with a purpose. The second guna that he mentions is prasada. It is the clarity of meaning achieved from the removal of redundant words. The next artha guna is shlesha. What is shlesha? Shlesha is the unity or the perfect commingling of many ideas in a poetic composition. The next guna, samata, consists in the non-relinquishment of proper sequence or continuity. Samadhi is the comprehension of meaning. This is the quality arising out of the creation of an elegant idea or meaning by keeping the mind concentrated. The meaning that is being created in this manner is of two kinds, namely Ayoni and Anyachayoni. Ayoni is the meaning originally created by the poet, while Anyachayoni is meaning borrowed from other sources. The original meaning has its source in the collected mind of the poet, while the other kind has its source in the wo works of other poets. This category called Ayoni or the original meaning can again be divided into two categories, namely explicit or Vyakta and subtle or Sukshma. The meaning that can easily be comprehended is called explicit or Vyakta and the meaning that can be understood only through proper analysis and reflection is called subtle or Sukshma. The subtle or Sukshma is again of two kinds namely Bhavya and Vasaniya. Bhavya variety of meaning is that which can be comprehended by a little thought, while Vasaniya is that which can be comprehended through a deep thought. The next quality is Mathurya. Mathurya is striking expression. Vamana says that where what is said is exceptionally impressive, then we have the quality of sweetness. The next artha guna that we are going to see is Saukumarya. What is this quality called Saukumarya? It is the absence of harsh sounds. It is a quality that we find in euphemistic expressions. Vamana says that, for example, if we say Yashaha Shesha instead of Mrtaha or if we say Devadvidiya instead of ekakina, we have the quality called saukumarya. This is somewhat similar to vakrokti. It arises out of ukti vaichitriya or deviant expression. The next artha guna is udharata. 
Udharata is the absence of vulgarity. The guna called artha vyakti is the clarity of meaning. Finally, the last guna is kanti. Kanti is the ability to generate rasas. Vahamana's conception of kanti as an artha guna was a major advancement from the previous theoretical position of alankara. Since this brought rasa into the remit of a formalistic perception of literary beauty, Having seen all these ten artha gunas, let us summarize these gunas once again. Ojas is the maturity of conception. Prasada is the clarity of meaning achieved from the removal of redundant words. Shlesha is the unity or the perfect commingling of many ideas in a poetic composition. Mathurya is striking expression. Samadha consists in the non-relinquishment of proper sequence or continuity. Samadhi is the comprehension of meaning. Saukumarya is the absence of harsh sounds. Udharata is the absence of vulgarity. Arthavyakti is the clarity of meaning. And finally, the last guna called Kandi is the ability to generate rasas. Finally, Vamana declares that it is only when all these qualities are fully manifest that the poetry is said to be fully ripe or developed. This type of poetry is said to have ripened like a mango. A poetic composition that has reached this state is said to have reached Amrapaka or the level of a ripened mango. That poetry where we have only the grammatical correct forms of nouns and verbs and where subject matter is obscene and is lacking in qualities, it is said to be uh, ripened only like a brinjal. That means, although it has ripened, it is not fit for eating. Vamana sees a guna or poetic merit as the vital force of literature. According to him, a verbal expression without a guna cannot become a kavya, just as a group of words syntax, without syntax cannot make a coherent meaning. Vamana's observation in this regard deserves a special mention in this context. He observes that piece of composition, the meaning whereof is entirely devoid of all qualities, is absolutely worthless. Such sentences, for instance, as ten pomegranates and the like, do not deserve the slightest consideration. Vamana borrows this example from Padanjali's Mahabhashya. Abhinavagupta also reproduces a fragment of this quotation in his Lojana on Ananda Vardhana's Thunyaloga, although it is in a different context altogether. Vamana did not consider Alankaras and Gunas to be of equal importance. He made a very clear cut distinction between Gunas and Alankaras. This approach was a different kind of approach from the approach of Bhamaha, Dandin and Utpada. Vamana used the term Alankara in its broader sense of beauty. Vamana says that beauty is always a necessary attribute for a poetic work, but that beauty does not need to necessarily arise from poetic figures or Alankaras alone. It has its source in Gunas as well. According to Vamana, the function of Alankara is only to enhance the beauty of Kavya, which is already beautified by the presence of Gunas. Vamana's observations about the importance of Guna are not worthy here, although they may appear to be politically incorrect. He says, just as a young woman endowed with beauty looks charming and the wearing of ornaments enhance this natural charm, so also in the case of poetry, if it is endowed with pure qualities, it acquires a peculiar charm and the presence of the ornaments or figures of speech serves to enhance this charm. On the other hand, if the woman happens to be devoid of youth, the addition of ornaments, even though excellent in themselves, only serves to accentuate the ugliness. So. In the case of poetry also, if the words are devoid of the qualities of style, 
the presence of figures of speech becomes a source of inelegance only. What Vamana says is that if a kavya is devoid of gunas, it cannot look good with the mere presence of alankaras. The major difference between gunas and alankaras was that gunas were permanent while alankaras were not. A poem could be beautiful even without figurative language, but it could not uh, do without the gunas that help to create a good riti. Vamana also rejects the conception that guna is the result of a peculiar kind of or a particular kind of reading or patha dharma. The advocates of this theory hold that non-stop reading is ojas, reading which stops here and there is prasada, reading with rise and fall perhaps in a sing-song manner is mathurya, clear and perfect reading with proper pronunciation is audarya and reading in neither too low nor too high a pitch is samya. We will see this theory in detail when we see the theory of guna conceptualized by Hemachandra. We have discussed quite a lot of points in this class today. I will wrap up the class by summarizing all the major points we have discussed so far. We saw that the theory of guna was properly conceptualized by Vamana in his Kavya Lankara Sutra Vritti. Vamana divided gunas into two broad categories namely Shabda gunas and Artha gunas. Shabda gunas are the poetic merits concerning the sound while Artha gunas are the ones that deal with the sound. He lists 10 gunas under each category. According to Vamana, Gunas are more important than Alankaras. The only function of an Alankara is to beautify a Kavya that is already beautified by Gunas. In the next class, we will see the theory of Guna conceptualized by Ananda Vartana and Pradihare Induraja. I hope you have understood all the major points we problematized today. Thank you.